Hey, Greg. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to talking with you. Mate, as a, as a bit of a kickoff, we're, you know, you've done a lot of cool stuff. Of, you know, I'm going to be sharing a bit of your profile here, but um, maybe you could kick off and just give us a little bit of your background. Um, I know that you, you ultimately um, built up Carousel 30 and you've done a few other things like that, and we'd love to hear about that transaction. Um, but maybe can you give us a bit of your background and what led to that? Yeah, just, um, you know, I can, I can start at a high level. So, you know, my second job out of college, I worked for a startup. I didn't start it. I was, you know, an employee. I was employee number five or six or something. And, you know, this was early 2000s. So it was one of those that no one's ever heard of these days. But, you know, it grew really quick and then ran out of money and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, I had a lot of fun doing that. I, they hired some amazing people and it really kind of taught me what I like, which is actually kind of a diverse um, mix of creative and marketing and technology. And so, you know, I, I was there for a couple of years. They ran out of money. I was um, laid off one day with, you know, 50 of my closest um, coworkers and, you know, just kind of decided at that point, you know, I don't want to work for someone again right now, if, if ever. But, you know, I ended up working for someone for a little bit, at least for a while. But um, you know, I just kind of decided, you know, there's got to be a different way. And so this was, you know, 2002, 2003. Um, I just started freelancing and I got really busy with freelance work. So busy that I, you know, either had to start turning down work or I was like, you know what? I bet I could get some other people to help me start something. And, I, you know, I knew nothing about business whatsoever. I mean, I'm a graphic design. I have a photography degree. Um, you know, nothing against photography degrees, but they don't teach you finance <laughs> and HR and operations and all that stuff. So like, you know, I just classic entrepreneur kind of thing. I thought I was going to start a company to do what I love all day long and ends up, I have to learn sales. I have to learn finance. I have to learn all that other stuff. But, um, so yeah, so I started Carousel 30 and, uh, we can get into more details about some of that, but like ran it for 14 years through that process, I actually acquired another company um, to help me grow. So I grew organically. I also grew through acquisition. And then ultimately, about 14 years later, I sold um, to another to a larger agency. It ended up being a roll up of about three agencies they bought over the course of a year. Um, joined that company for a little bit for about 18 months or so, and then struck back out on my own to, um, you know, just uh, really do a, do a number of different things. I started another another company um, as well, but you know now I'm now I'm helping consult other whether it's small businesses or very large businesses on a, on a number of things. Yeah, man, that's awesome. I, you know, it's funny we talk to a lot of people on the show, right? And and people with different journeys. And you know, with a with a podcast named Buy Build Sell, you know, it's obviously a bit of a cycle, right? People kind of get yeah. in, they do some stuff, they get out. Um, I always I love chatting to guests who've done the cycle. And, yeah. and are either brave enough or crazy enough to go and do it again. <laughs> right, right, right. Yes, that's, that's me. Um, yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's interesting. Well, I definitely, you know, the second time I knew, you know, I, I knew from the start that the possibility was to sell. And, you know, so I've got, I can't talk a lot about it right now, but I've got something else that I, that I've started over the last year or so. And we're in a, we're in a good position to, um, for an acquisition and stuff like that as well, but nothing, nothing. I'm not going to retire on an island anywhere, but you know, something, <laughs> you know, a good, a good enough deal that you know it was worth it was worth starting. But yeah, the first time, you know, I just, I, I mean, I started it with some friends basically, and we thought, you know, hey, we're going to have a lot of fun and 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 all that, and then you know, I ended up. They they kind of went their separate ways. I held on to the company, bought them out. Um, I started subcontracting to another company and really started, I started subcontracting almost all of my work to them. And so, you know, we were in meetings all day, every day together. We were just kind of, one day we just looked at each other, the owner and, and I, and we were just like, why don't we just merge our companies basically? I mean, technically I acquired them, but you know, why don't we just, you know, move in together basically to use that analogy. And so, you know, it made a lot of sense. And, and so we did that for about four years. And then I ended up buying, uh, we brought another partner on actually through that process, but I ended up buying those two partners out. So at that point, it was about 2013. So about four years before I sold the company. And that's when I really got serious about things. And um, once I bought them out, I, I first thing I did, I hired like an interim CFO to really come in who had experience in my in the marketing industry 
Um, and just, you know, I asked him like, listen, tell me what I really have here. Like it's, you know, it's near and dear to my heart. So I love it. I think it's the most amazing thing, but tell me what I actually have. And, and then that was really my education. I feel like I got my MBA over those few years because I learned about, you know, utilization rates and, you know, real profitability and multipliers, you know, all of that stuff before I kind of let other people deal with that stuff for me. Um, you know, the financial the operation stuff. But that's when I really, I, you know, really kind of got my stuff together and, and just said, you know what, I'm either going to grow by acquiring more companies or I'm going to grow by selling. And ultimately, it didn't take me that long to figure out. It just made sense to position to sell. And so, you know, that's what I did. And, um, yeah. you know, yeah. Man, that's cool. Like, there's so much to unpack there. Right, and, right. And, and, and before I jump in and start asking some more, take me back a little bit. So, Carousel 30, explain to, to us, you mentioned marketing, yeah. but for us marketing dummies, maybe, get, what did Carousel 30 do? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, so if we go back to 2003, so, you know, late 2003 is when we started. So, you know, there was this thing called Flash and, you know, people built like Flash websites. Now, you know, Apple, the iPhone killed that, you know, so nobody even knows what it is anymore. <laughs> there was really no social media. I mean, I think YouTube might have been started in late 2003. Facebook was kind of in existence. Maybe MySpace was like the social MySpace and Friendster were like big, you know, big in that world. We saw the really the rise of social media marketing becoming a thing that corporations did. I mean, you know, when we started, that was that was nothing. Um, and, you know, we really we saw that. Um, saw the rise of artificial intelligence being used in marketing, so personalization, all of those types of technologies. Saw websites become a lot more sophisticated and, you know, using things like AI, but also other, you know, marketing technology. So, you know, I can't say that we were ever the very first to use some of those things, but we were very early adopters of a lot of those things. I mean, we... You know, I remember for a very large organization that we worked with on their very first social media marketing campaign, they we had to send the YouTube um, terms of service to their lawyers to approve for us to upload a file to YouTube. I mean, that's how early it was. <laughs> and so, you know, we made a viral video campaign for them in, you know, 2005 or something like that. You know, so that it was I mean, it was fun times. It was, you know, again, got to got to try a lot of a lot of cool stuff early on. Um, what I found, and actually, you know, one of the reasons I was a little burned out towards the end of, of owning that agency just for running it 14 years. But one of the other reasons that I really made the decision to sell was I did see that what I was doing was becoming more and more of a commodity. And so, you know, I saw the price point for what I was offering dip. I, I want to say almost 50% from, you know, over a f maybe five or six year period. And so, you know, we were working harder my salary costs were rising and yet what i was able to demand from clients was you know decreasing year over year and i was just like you know what i can't do this for you know for a long period of time so i sold to a much larger company that had the you know they they had larger clients and you know they had a kind of a different business model as far as how they build and everything like that and so you know for them acquiring us and our you know, basically our processes and some of our clients and everything like that was a good move for me. It was, I think it, I did it at just the right time because my, again, my price point kept, kept um, lowering and I was just going to keep making less profit and have to hire more and more junior people. And so, you know, I, I feel lucky that I was able to make that decision at that time. No, that's cool. And I, and I think what you just described there, I think a lot of people would be nodding their heads um, in both understanding that that's happening in the marketing space, but it also happens in pl plenty of industries, right? Yeah. Um, so it's, you know, I guess that natural um, sort of life cycle of, of a lot of different types of businesses. Um, stepping back a bit, again, to the sort of those earlier days. So you mentioned you started Carousel 30 with some friends? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, another one of those things that, you know, if I if I knew now. Uh, so, you know, it was it was a college friend and his wife and my now ex-wife um, as well. So, you know, we were all we were all fast friends. I mean, we all actually still speak to each other. So that's good. But <laughs> that's um, so, you know, not, a, not a messy breakup on any. Fr I've, I've actually never had a nightmare kind of such even though I bought partners out and all that stuff. So I feel very fortunate that I've, I've at least 
been lucky in that regard. But, you know, it just it was clear early on that not everybody really wanted the same things. And, you know, for my part in what we were doing, I always wanted to grow and kind of push things a little bit further in, you know, in a more in the marketing realm of things. And my other partner wanted to do more things in film and video. And so, you know, we just kind of kind of split based on those kinds of differences and, you know, other yep. other things like that. But, you know, it, it, it taught me a lot about, you know, I've, I've had lots of different partners over the years in, in business and it's tough. You know, it's never, you know, it's it's right now I'm completely independent and kind of loving it. But I know it's probably, you know, it, that that works for certain things, but it's I'm probably going to have partners again yet in my career because it just makes sense. You just have to be really careful when you do it. And again, you know, I, I was fortunate to to have ones that, you know, no lawsuits or anything like that. But um, it's still, yeah, it's, it's, it's like any relationship. It takes work. Yeah. It's, I, I'm fascinated with this sort of stuff because, I mean, ultimately business is a function of people, right? And, and, yeah. and relationships and how we work together. And um, so quick, uh, quick compliance question. Did you, did you guys have a, uh, did you put a shareholders agreement together? Did you, how, how formal was this coming together of friends? Yeah, so that was not very formal at all. I'll, I'll be honest, and I mean, yeah, I think s- uh, statutes of limitations have probably passed, but at this point, so you know, but yeah, it was it was pretty informal. I mean, we you know we did the basic registration with the government and all that kind of stuff, but yep. um, you know, a much more recent, you know, two more recent things. I mean, you know, it was definitely the official way, and we got lawyers involved and, and all that stuff. I mean, very early on. I mean, I was. I think it was 25 years old and knew again knew nothing about anything and neither did they so we were all just like this is cool right um and <laughs> even even kind of you know the the me acquiring their their shares and everything i mean we wrote up a document but man i bet if i looked at that today i would like i myself would be shocked that i ever signed something <laughs> like that so you learn a yeah. lot in you know twenty years, right? <laughs> yeah, look, totally, totally. Look, and and I, for what it's worth, I see lots of very, very mature business with very experienced people who don't have shareholders agreements and stuff yeah. like that. So it's it's you know obviously you only need it when you need it, right. um, but it's right. often when you need it, it's too late to get it. So it's it's just one of those curious questions. I'm always interested in how people kind of start off and and where does it go and does it did it go where you thought it would and right. you know so it's. it's yeah. So, um, so out, out of interest, when when you were chatting with your friends in those early days, I mean, did you guys, um, you know, how did things how did things evolve a little bit from expectations? You know, did you? Did, yeah. I mean, obviously, you said that you went in sort of slightly different directions, but it's um, did you sit down and talk about what do we want this company to actually be and achieve, or was it kind of more organic? <laughs> well, no, we did, we did. So, I mean, it, we had the. We had kind of a head start of I was doing some freelance work already and had some clients and my other partner, he had some clients as well. So we kind of had that head start of like there was some organic growth already happening. But, you know, I'll be honest, again, knowing now what I know, we did no market research on did, you know, I live outside Washington, D.C. So like, does the Washington, D.C. region need another marketing agency I'll, I can tell you now it, it doesn't. There's plenty. There's plenty of them, but um, too late for you know too late for Carousel Thirty. But um, but you know we did no research on is there some kind of niche that we could fill? Is there an industry with a gap? Or you know all all of these things now that you know I want to say come naturally to me. Even though you know you can never do too much research in a sense, but it's like you know all these things that I would definitely do, or I, I now counsel others to do that I work with. None of it. It was just sort of like, I can make a website, you can make a video, you know, they, we've got a project manager or somebody doing accounting. That sounds like a company, right? You know, I mean, again, we're kids, like it's, um, you know, and we, we, we did fine. We did fine, but you know, it wasn't, it, so to your, to your point, I guess we achieved our goals because we didn't have a real, there wasn't a real vision of that. And I think that's where, you know, later, later on, it, you know, iterations of even that company, I had a much stronger, you know, path of, okay, this is what I want to do. This is how, you know, revenue goals and, you know, industry, we started focusing on certain, ind- like financial services industry was a big focus for us towards the end. And that really, you know, just having a niche that we focused on really helped us grow, even though I was, 
I was kind of adverse to that at the beginning. But, you know, all of those things that everyone kept telling me this stuff for years and years finally started listening. And then all of a sudden, you know, we grew and, and we had recurring revenue and we had all, you know, clients, you know, coming out of the woodwork basically because they knew what we offered as opposed to us just kind of being a bunch of kids, you know, to try to have fun basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that makes sense. I, I think too, when you're younger, you know, you're willing to just kind of get out there and have a bit of a crack at things and you, you know, you've got right. so much runway, right? You can kind of, eh, well, right. if it works, it works. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. But um, um, out of interest, did your experience with that employer, that startup, that built up and then kind of, you know, eventually laid everyone off and whatever else, do, do you think that that experience um, shaped your perspective on business much as you then went off into your own venture? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I did learn a lot from that. I mean, I learned I learned a lot about marketing. To be honest, I mean, my background was really only in creative. So, you know, I, I my degree was in photography, but I took a lot of graphic design and as many, you know, I graduated very late 90s. So like as many web design and whatever classes that they had at that time, which was not a lot, but you know, I took every single thing I could possibly get. So I learned a lot about marketing. I also learned how to talk to technology people. And so, you know, it was most, it was a, you know, SaaS, they didn't call it SaaS but at the time, but it was a SaaS startup. And so uh, basically it was 80% Java developers and, you know, me and one other designer and then some business people. And so I learned to talk to those Java engineers and learned so much about you know, just how to how to exist in that environment. And I think it really shaped me because I, you know, I didn't learn how to write code, but I, I've always worked, you know, since then I've always worked around technology and felt comfortable talking with people that, that do that. And so, you know, that was tremendous. Um, you know, business wise, I don't think I learned a ton really. I mean, their story, I mean, they raised about $11 million, I think, in about 90 seconds. It was kind of that, that was, those were the times. So, you know, they did a pitch in front of, I think, a bunch of drunk VCs one night. And <laughs> kudos to that. I mean, they were smart guys, you know, MIT, like engineer, like super smart guys. But like, those were the times that we, you know, that we lived in at that time. You know, we had the foosball table and the, you know, free lunch on Friday. And, you know, we had all that, all that good stuff. But um, but yeah, I mean, I learned I learned a lot about the I guess the more tactical stuff that really helped me understand you know how to start running an agency. I guess. Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, so okay, so you guys, you jump in, you're running Carousel Thirty, it's starting to grow and do stuff. Um, at what point during that journey? I mean, I, you know, you you said that you've acquired a company. I think two you mentioned, but. Um, like I, I think most business owners have this realization at some point that if I want to keep growing, there's really only two kind of basic levers, right? Is there's organic growth or there's acquisitions, right. um, and and some people will do a bit of both, right? But yeah. was there a point in time that you kind of had a moment that you realized maybe acquisitions was a better way to go, and and did you go out looking for them, or did just an opportunity come by, or you know, can can you talk us yeah. through that? Yeah, so. Um Right after I bought my last set of partners out um, and I, you know, I, I brought on the CFO to, to really help me. I actually, I was, I was not thinking about selling at all. I mean, that, that was a, that was a possibility that, you know, that my CFO co coached me on that, you know, keep your mind open, you know, but I really, I went after and intentionally went after acquisitions and I'll be honest, I, I tried, I think two, I got, I got a, a fair amount um, down the road, down the path on, but, you know, for one reason or another, it fell through. And a third, you know, I got a little, you know, it was more just a couple conversations and it fell through. And, you know, after I think the third, I just really decided, you know what, there's, there's something that's not working here for me acquiring, you know, maybe I need to open my mind a little bit more to this idea of getting acquired. And, you know, that was also when I just started feeling like, you know, the, the, the price point, the commoditization of what we're doing, as well as, you know, I just, I, I think, you know, as a, as a business owner, after a while, you, I feel like you start to have this, it's all, you feel this gut feeling of, okay, here's how much money is coming down the pot. I mean, I'm glad I had that CFO because he could tell me exactly how much money we were getting and how profitable we were going to be. But there's a, there's kind of an intuitive feeling that I think you get 
And I just started feeling more and more like, man, this is this is just getting harder and harder to get the same amount of money in order to really grow um, without, you know, w- even with an acquisition, but even, you know, without an acquisition, I'm going to have to basically retool this entire organization and do something vastly different. And that means a lot of work. And I just, I'll be honest, I, I'm a hard worker and I'm very ambitious, I think at least, but I just didn't have it in me after 14 years to really do that. And I was just like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to step away and maybe, you know, maybe after a year and a half at another two years at another company, I might not even want to do marketing anymore. And and sure enough, I don't want to run a marketing agency anymore with, you know, with that. I love those days. It was fun. It was, you know, no regrets, but um, but yeah, so to your, to answer your question, I mean, yeah, I, I pursued several, several acquisitions and it just fell through for one reason or the other. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, that makes sense. And look, and for what it's worth, I mean, I think this idea of, I think it takes a, a good chunk of emotional intelligence to actually work, understand where your business is going and to be able to make the call that you don't have the energy or the desire perhaps to go and take it into that next level or that next stage. It's, yeah. um, you know, I think I think there is a real danger for people sometimes hanging on too long and not being the guy or the girl that can do that next stage and the business and the potential employees and customers suffer. Yeah, so, and I um, think, you know, maybe one of the reasons, so the, 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 acquisi- the two main acquisitions that I was pursuing, my strategy was to so you know here in the in the Washington D.C. metro area there you know number of agencies in the good old days of you know like like the Mad Men days so to speak there were a lot of big advertising agencies a lot of those owners were now you know I mean maybe it's second generation owners even but like a lot of those people were ready to get out of the business and so my strategy was. Let me find someone with a good book of business that has like maybe they want to stay in 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 the game for about two more years and then transition out. I'll take over their company, take over their clients, and you know we might lose a few, but um, but for the most part we kind of gain all that. That was my strategy, for better or worse. Um, in every case, those people ended up changing their minds and saying, uh, you know what, I want to stay another year, another year, and you know what, I've I've kept in touch with all of them. Some of them maybe made the right choice. They sold them maybe a year or two later. Um, I've know some other ones that um, they stayed too long, and then mm-hmm. you know they they weren't they didn't have the energy like they used to anymore. And I mean that's so to your point, that's a it's a danger. And you know that that was kind of in the back of my mind too. Where, you know I was I was younger than those people, but I still didn't want to get stuck into something where oh my god. Greg's never going to unload Carousel 30. No one wants that anymore. You know, I, I just didn't want to be in that position. Yeah, yeah. No, look, I, was, uh, I think that uh, takes a fair bit of emotional intelligence to be able to process that and arrive at a conclusion where you can start making decisions because I, I think a lot of people get paralyzed, you know, and they, they yeah. just keep doing what they're doing because they're not able to make the leap to that next stage. So so yeah. well done, I guess, for getting to that at such oh, an early age. Um. Just I'll step back again. I mean, you mentioned buying out your partners. It's uh, can, can you talk me through that a little bit without going into anything that may or may not be sensitive, I guess. But it's I just uh, I I think a lot of people out there in business with business partners have these moments where they think, oh, geez, is this still fit for purpose? This relationship is it still the be- in the best yeah. interest of everybody and the business and whatnot? But the idea of approaching that discussion could be quite awkward. Um, yeah. How, yeah. how did you find it? How did that come about? Yeah, I mean, and I'll be honest, it was awkward. I mean, again, we we still talk, but, you know, not that much, but we still talk. Um, but, uh, you know, it's it just kind of, so I guess to, again, without going into excruciating detail, you know, we had, there were three partners. Um, one of them got, moved moved away for personal reasons, like family reasons and stuff like that. So, was kind of out of the picture and yet owned, owned some equity. And so that was an easier conversation of like, hey, you're not around anymore. You know, I'm just going to make, let's make it official and I'll just, you know, I'll buy you out and everything like that. The other one that was more active, you know, I think we just, we quickly, you know, after the other partner left, we kind of quickly enough realized that we didn't want the same things. And, you know, we worked reasonably well together. And, you know, he, he was involved in one part of the business, I was involved in another. So, you know, we complimented each other. But 
you know, when it really came down to it, I wanted to grow the company a lot. Like I, that, that was my thing. You know, I was, I was tasked with marketing and sales and as well as some of the creative stuff, but you know, I was tasked with the growth oriented stuff. He was tasked with the more operational stuff. And so, you know, it was kind of like, no, let's keep status quo because we were profitable. And I, you know, it was because of him and, and his work that we actually turned profits and paid ourselves out. You know, there were there were scary days early on where, you know, it was like, what do we get paid this month or whatever? But, you know, he got us to a place where, you know, we were getting paid good salaries and stable and no layoffs or anything like that. So, you know, that was good, but I just wanted more. And, you know, that's just kind of the way that I am. And, um, and so, you know, we just kind of decided that. And so, you know, one day, yes, it was an awkward conversation. I just, you know, I told him, listen, you know, I don't think, you know, I think we could do this for a, for a while, but I wouldn't be happy. And if I'm not happy, you know, you're not really going to be happy either because I'm just, you you're not going to like a partner that's unhappy either. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I kind of just said like in, in the nicest way possible, you know, I think one of us needs to go. And I was open to leaving at that point even. So yep. um, I had to, I had enough confidence at that point that I knew I could probably start something and, you know, I'd have to figure out non-competes or whatever, but like, um, you know, I felt confident enough I could do that. And, you know, he ended up just, you know, saying, no, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll go. He's, he's super happy doing, he's a contractor, just kind of loan, loan consultant and doing his thing and you know it's more status quo and i'm sure he's making more money but like um you know he it's not running a company and it's not doing all that stuff like i wanted like the i wanted the brand and growing and all that stuff I and mean, that's just kind of my nature so you know it, it worked out i mean it was, there were some awkward days and and some you know trying to figure it out but you know it, everything amicable and you know lawyers were involved at that point because we were grown-ups and we involved lawyers and things <laughs> but not because they were it was confrontational or anything like that so yeah yeah no that's that's great and it's great that you got a good outcome i mean you know i think you could expect a little bit of awkwardness through these types of things yeah. but it's i think it's where the awkwardness kind of sometimes turns a little bit nasty and then that can lead to disaster so you know once again i mean i think you've navigated something quite challenging in, in by the sounds of it in a very good way. So, um, so yeah, well yeah. done again. Thanks. Um, <laughs> hey, yeah, I'm curious though, when you, when you talk about buying out a partner, how, how do you come up with a number? Like did, did, yeah. did you use a formula or a methodology or did you get some advice? What, what was that like? Yeah. I mean, so at that, at that point, um, we weren't, we still weren't that sophisticated, I guess, in the, in the way that we were doing it. I mean, again, you know, in a, in a, in my next thing that I started, we were much more sophisticated and got evaluation and, and all that stuff. We did kind of back of the napkin math and, you know, just kind of figured out something that was reasonable and what I could afford, you know, to, I basically, I basically put my partners on retainer um, for a period of time. And, you know, they were cool with that because it was like, you know, they were both transitioning into other work and it was like, you know, paid part of their, you know, paid their rent <laughs> basically for, you know, for a number of months so, um, you know, it was, it was, I was not a very sophisticated way of doing that. Um, yeah, like I said, I mean, next, the next time, the next time that happened, I actually got bought out and we did a lot more sophisticated, um, th that was at a company I started after Carousel 30, but, um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's cra Again, looking back, I'm like, man, I can't believe we did some of the stuff we did, but <laughs> you know, all's well that ends well, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Look, absolutely. And, and so, I mean, okay. So that that approach, though. I mean, okay. So you guys came down. You you came up with some sort of a number. Um, out of interest, was it? Did you do like the classic? You know, we'll just multiply this number by that number, or something like that. Or did it? Was it just a raw number? Or you know? Yeah, we we made we did some multipliers of. I mean, you know, at that point, I think our you know our profit. I mean. I benefited from that because we ended up having a great year that year, but the prior sure. year was, was a bit challenging. And so I, I guess, you know, I did do it at the right time. I mean, I wish I could take credit for that and say, man, I planned this and like did it at the absolute right time. It was more an emotional and a, a social reason that I did it than a uh, man, like I'm going to get extract every bit of value. Again, I, I feel fortunate that I, we had some, some, a good year that year, but um, yeah, no, it was, it, it was a multiplier of the previous year's revenue, but 
it was still, you know, it was still a little back of the napkin kind of math. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fair enough. And so it, it just paid out over time, meaning that you didn't have to come up with cash up front. Is that right? Right, right, exactly. Yeah, we just we didn't have that much cash on hand, so it was yeah. it was kind of the way to make it work. And I think you know, it, it's um, yeah, it was basically like having a, a an extra employee or two for a you know for a period of time. But you know, that was we were doing well enough that we could do that. And you know, the in the marketing world, retainers were still very popular, so. We had several retainers. I mean, basically, we had a client that just paid for those partners is, is the way yeah. that I looked yeah. at it. Yeah, no, I think that makes sense. And I think it's great that you're able to find a deal where you can use that kind of a tool or approach because, you know, at the end of the day, it's about the solution and it's, been, and, you know, funding businesses is, you know, we're, yeah. we're not all sitting around with Google billions in our pockets. So, you know. <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> um, no, that's cool. And, and And look, I think there'll be a lot of people listening to this who will, be thinking about how they might want to approach a conversation with their own business partners. So, um, so I think that's, that's very cool. Yeah. Um, What I would say there just, uh, you know, I just try to be as transparent and as, you know, forthcoming as possible and, you know, sometimes to a fault, but you know, it hasn't failed me yet. And, you know, just being honest, nobody has to like what you have to say, but you know, I, I always tried to be honest and I, you know, I, I credit my partners as well as just, Again, there were definitely times of frustration and I'm sure there were some words said here or there or whatever. But at the end of the day, you know, it was we were honest with each other about what we wanted and didn't want. And, you know, I think that if, you know, I guess it it's one of those things where it's like any relationship, you know, when you go into something with someone, if you can't imagine breaking up with that person, you know, as much as you like, you, you know, whether it's a significant other or a business partner, if you're like, man, I don't ever want to break up with that person, like, don't ever partner with them in any way whatsoever. And, you know, again, I've been, I've been divorced, I've gotten, you know, I've, I've broken up with partners, in all cases, you know, at least I, I've made plenty of mistakes, but at least, you know, at least that that part of me, you know, is kind of telling me giving me the right advice there. Yeah, it's, I think that's great advice. Yeah, I mean, well, at least if, don't get into business with anyone that you don't have a potential exit strategy with as well, right? Or, right. And, and hence, geez, we've almost come full circle here. But there's the shareholders agreement, right? Hey, if right. something did go wrong, here's some mechanisms that we can take or use that to right. to to separate. And and so, yeah, I, I think that. Um, but that's that is good advice. Trust your gut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the other thing, Greg, and, and you strike me as being a very reasonable guy, and and uh, I, you mentioned being open and transparent and honest with each other, which I think is critical. But I get the sense too that there's an element of you also actually need to be open to listening to other people's truth, yeah. <laughs> as well as sharing your own. And and I I get a sense of reasonableness from you, and I imagine that's the approach you took. But it's. There's, there's no point just standing there saying, this is my truth and you have to accept it, right? <laughs> right. I, you know, I just, I try to live by this philosophy of there's always got to be a win-win scenario out there. And, you know, that's not, nothing is 100% true, but I strongly believe, you know, I, I, I never believe that me winning means that someone else has to lose. And, you know, the, the minute, again, in any relationship, you know, I see like married couples where it's like, somebody's trying to get one over on somebody else. And like, is that really winning? You know, is that other person that you're married to being miserable, you winning in, in which case, like how in the world, you know, what, what kind of world is that? And so again, I, I use a lot of analogies with personal relationships and business relationships because I just think other than a few details, they're not really that different than, than one another. And so, you know, same thing goes. It's like, I always, I try to find that win-win because part of it is like long-term, like, again, I can look back and, you know, I've certainly got regrets, but I don't have deep regrets about those things because I really tried. And I I know they tried as well to find some kind of like, I'm not, they're not screwing me over. I'm not screwing them over and, you know, try to find the win-win in in everything. And you know what, if you try, I bet you can get really close if not actually achieve it. Yeah, I think that's really, really good advice. Um, you know, it's, it's something I find in our our primary business exit, exit advisory group. You know, we do a lot of transactions, right? And and we're always sort of talking to our clients at the beginning of any sort of process and saying, 
you know, listen, no, nobody actually gets everything they want. <laughs> yeah. And, right. and if you do get absolutely everything you want, then it has probably been at the expense of the other party. Right. And, and that ends up having consequences. Sometimes there's actually very serious backlash from it. Sometimes it kills the deals. Um, and so I think the more people can go in with an open mind about things and, and understand what are the things they can't live with, what are the things they can't live without, and surely there's a whole bunch of things in different shades of grey in the middle that we're willing to compromise on. And yeah. um, I, I, I just find that more deals and better deals get done with people who can keep that kind of mindset. Yeah, com- completely agree. Yeah, and I think, you know, that's... And I will say, you know, the the CFO person that I mentioned, I mean, they, you know, he's uh, basically an M&A advisor that I brought on and, you know, for that reason. And, you know, so I will say having that counsel there all along was, you know, incredible, you know, so in other words, the work that you're doing as well, like, it is incredibly helpful to particularly someone, you know, back in the day, knew nothing brought me up to speed on, you know, on on really how things should be done. And now, you know, I, I've involved the same person and company in like three different deals over the, you know, over the last five years or so, just because, yeah, it's, you know, finding the right person that has that mindset as well is good because you know there's there are lawyers out there that are sharks and they're like you got to get everything you can but i can't deal with those people because they're that's not me yeah yeah look i i totally understand and appreciate that as well it's yeah i think those those good advisors and this your cfo sounds like this kind of guy too he's the guy the, you need somebody who can give you good advice and also occasionally Pardon me, but call call us on our bullshit, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, several <laughs> times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. So um, I'm fortunate enough. I, I have my wife is our co-founder as well, so I've got someone who's very good at calling me on mine. So, <laughs> 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 so, so Greg, take us forward from here, right? So you've gone through such an experience here. I mean, you started with friends, have gone people have gone different ways, got all this sort of stuff goes on. And eventually, 14 years, you, you've eventually sold your business. Yeah. Can you talk us through what that kind of process looked like from, I guess, from the early stages of you having thoughts about selling your business to maybe what the process looked like, how long it took, all that sort of stuff? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, you know, I'll say it was a pretty, I've been told it was a very streamlined process. And so cool. you know, a couple of reasons for that. One I knew what I wanted at that point. You know, it took me a little while to figure out that I wanted to sell. But once I, it, maybe that part of that is just me. And also I didn't have any partners. So it, it was, it could be a unilateral decision. So, you know, I knew that I wanted to sell. I didn't have to get approval from anyone, you know, to do that. Um, and I had my stuff in order. I mean, again, I, you know, I had somebody from a financial perspective that had been preparing Basically, I could walk into the room and I had all the paperwork from the last three years because I was seeing those reports every month for other reasons as well. So, you know, I was just I was prepared. I was ready to do it. And, you know, so I had a there was there was a couple offers on the table at the time. And, you know, I, ma- I made a pretty quick decision. But, you know, I, I, I met with a couple places. One of them had actually approached me earlier Ah, uh, okay. Um, so I was going to ask you, how, how did you come across these parties? Like, where did they come from? So, so one of them approached you, did they, in the past? Yeah. So about, you know, a couple of years prior to that, they approached me. I entertained it a little bit, but I just, you know, I wasn't ready. I still thought I was going to grow and, and take over the world and, and all that stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, with, in my industry, it's a fairly tight knit community. So, you know, and I, I was on, I was on some boards with some other people in the, in the advertising community. So, you know, I, I knew all the heads of the agencies basically that were much, you know, at this point, much bigger than mine, but um, so, yeah, so one, I approached, um, I approached and just said, Hey, are you interested? They were, but, you know, ended up not, um, not going with them. The other one, they approached me and, yeah, it just, you know, it felt like a good fit. Um, they were going to take care of all my people. So they were going to bring out literally even the interns they brought over. So I didn't nice. lose, a, you know, no staff was lost. They needed what I was, you know, what I offered. So it was a complimentary service. So it wasn't, um, there was a little bit of redundancy, but in a good way. So, you know, I felt like we could contribute some value to the, you know, to the new org. And like I briefly mentioned, they they acquired two other companies over a 12 month period. That's a whole other, <laughs> that's probably a topic for a whole other show, but, yeah. um, you know, just rolling up all those cultures and, you know, we were a small, you know, we were about 12 people. So, you know, small company, but, 
um, it's still you know combining cultures and and all and yeah. systems and processes and all that stuff. That's a I've learned a lot about that too, and it motivated me to get into into some other work that I've done previously, just that experience. But um, but yeah, so you know, it just it it was a pretty I I want to say within three months it was all said and done, and wow. Um, you know, cause we were just, they were motivated. I was motivated. We had all our stuff in order. They knew what they wanted as well, which was fortunate. Um, so yeah, it was just, you know, we were kind of, it felt like less than that. It felt like two weeks, but, yeah. um, but you know, it was a pretty, pretty smooth process. And, you know, there was a few, you know, tech technology, like system, like those kinds of hurdles, you know, after the fact, but, you know, really, you know, getting in the door, it was a it was a pretty pretty seamless process. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, it so can so often go in different directions. So the the fact that you got a deal done and happened fairly smoothly in a short period of time is is fabulous. Um, how did you feel? So did you had two different parties there that had shown some interest? How important was that to you? Having more than one kind of potential sort of girl at the dance, shall we say, yeah. how important was that to you for your own, I guess, psychology and, and sense of comfort going into that, that discussion? Yeah, I, I did really want to know that I was getting the best possible deal. And, you know, it's, um, I probably could have taken a little bit longer and gotten even more offers, but, you know, I just, I only have so much attention to be able to do that. And, you know, we were kind of in a place where we had to we had to make a decision of, you know, are we going to keep going with this? And, you know, I, w- I was very worried. I was worried about how clients were going to handle any of it. And so, you know, again, small community word travels fast. So if there's kind of murmurings about things, I just didn't want want the process to drag out. I also didn't want to lose employees because, you know, we were a small shop as it was. I didn't want people leaving because they thought they were going to get laid off and they might have in, in some scenarios. So, you know, probably a good thing for them to look but you know i i I wanted it to just happen smoothly and i I mean the main decision i mean financial considerations were a dis were i i would say equal to financial for me was really just is my team going to be taken care of and um and i mean clients too but i kind of knew that if i could get if i could get it done quickly enough i could take care of the clients because you know at that point they trusted me and everything like that so yeah, you know, it's um, the other the other place, you know, would have been good. It would have been a good deal for me, but not as good deal for the rest of the team. And I don't think it would have been better enough for me um, to actually make it worth my while, you know, to, to do that. So, yeah. And, you know, I, I I knew a bunch of people at the at the place that acquired um, as well. I knew some I knew the owners at the at the other place, but I knew a lot more people at the at the place that ended up acquiring. So, you know, it just felt like. It felt like a right. natural kind of transition. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so a- a- out of interest in that space, um, so you- you've gone beyond buying a partner out and, as you, as you say, maybe, you know, less sophistication, less experience, et cetera. Yeah. But in-, in the marketing industry and in the consulting space that you're in, is there a typical way that these businesses get valued? Um, yeah, I mean, there's a... You know, they're typical. Uh, there's a multiplier. I mean, it's less than so. Post that, I did. I did another. I did a SaaS startup of my own. So you know, the multipliers on that are very, <laughs> very different and much more favorable. Um, but um, yeah, you know, I, it's a uh, um, man. I, it's been a little while <laughs> since I <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, since I thought through all this stuff. But yeah, there's there's a pretty there's a typical way of doing it, and you know, I think it's like a three to five times multiplier and. And stuff yep. like that, and um, yeah. And, so, and know, is we, that is that of is that of EBITDA or is that? Yeah, it's like, yeah. it's EBITDA. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Yeah. So 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 do they do they send you an LOI or so sorry a letter of intent for those who are not familiar with yep. the acronyms, but do they send you a letter of intent and say, look, we think you're worth X, and we came to X because it's uh, this number times that number. Is that kind of how it worked? Yeah, that's that's what they did, and they wanted me to just commit to not shopping around as well. So it was kind of too, you know, they they said, "Hey, this is what we think your you know your company's worth," and just very broad structure. You know, we went into more detail in, in contracts and stuff, but you know, broad details of this is what we think, and we're not going to move forward unless you say you're going to stop shopping your company around. And then after we got to that point, 
it was it was a pretty quick back and forth process on just hammering out some details and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, that that's, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and and for those listening too, that that whole idea of not shopping around. I mean, that's a very common and very reasonable approach. It's um, you know, for a buyer to do due diligence, they spend a lot of time and money and. You know, for them, really what they're saying is, hey, if you think my number's good enough, well, let's commit to getting through this process and don't kind of double date me and, you know, <laughs> go and yeah. suddenly sell the company from under us. So it's, it's yeah, I mean, it's, that's a fairly normal thing to expect. Um, so, um, and, and, and Greg, out of interest and without getting into the nitty gritty of personal details, I find with a lot of different deals that, that the consideration that's paid for deals often falls into kind of a blend of three buckets. Um, and, and it could be all in one bucket, but, but it often can be a blend across two or three. So, you know, an upfront cash component, perhaps a deferred component that's not at risk, it just gets paid over time, and then, and then a component that could be an earn out. Yeah. Um, can, can you share with us what your experience looked like a little bit? Did you have any of those factors involved? Yeah, all, all three actually. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, there right. was a, there was an initial yeah initial like you know make Greg feel good about his his decision or whatever. I got a new car or whatever, and um, <laughs> you know all that good stuff. But um, but yeah, it was it was all of that, and you know the um, the earnout. You know, I got to say it was a little challenging to you know to earn <laughs> to earn all of that, but. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a challenge, but yeah, that the deal was, the deal was all that piece, um, you know, yeah. and then it really just came down to me kind of, um, you know, keeping clients happy and growing and, and all that stuff. And, you know, that's what I was going to have to do if I kept the company going as well. I mean, you know, I think, you know, my, my decision was also based on, I did want to grow, you know, so, you know, my, my idea here was, okay, this was a larger company that could take me on that, you know, they had bigger clients than mine, you know, so there was, there was opportunity there. And so, you know, I, I think that was, that was good. And it was weird a little bit to be an employee after being an owner for, for <laughs> four, I mean, I was on the executive team, but still, you know, I was, yeah. I was an employee. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a change, but, um, you know, but it was good. You know, they're good people. They treated me and they treated my team excellent. So, you know, yeah. from that standpoint, it was good. I, you know, I stayed the the minimum amount of time that I could to, you know, in, in full honesty, um, just because so how, I, how long, yeah. how long did that earn out go for though, that period? Um, so two years, two years. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. can I ask, did, did you, did you hit the earn out in full or was there a, Part component. Um, of it I hit most of it, not yeah. not a hundred percent. Okay. And, and yeah. 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 It's 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 such a contentious issue, right? Like the 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 earnouts. I've I've had guests on here who go, "Hey, I I I, I hit it all. I got my earnout. I got it in full. I was happy." And then I've had yeah. other people who said, "I hated the experience so much, I walked away from the earnout. Just said, keep the money. I'm leaving." <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, it's it's sort of, it, yeah. It's it's a challenge to, you know. I mean, there were there were more resources at my disposal in a larger company, and so you know, on that front, it was it was good. But there were challenges of just simply not being, you know, some of the things that I might have chased unilaterally with my own company weren't necessarily in the best interests of that of that company, or yeah. they had to compete at a different price point than I was able to, and thus they just lost the work. And so, you know, it it, it was a bit frustrating. You know, I'll I'll be honest because. Um, I, I might have gotten a hundred percent of that if, you know, if for a few, you know, if for a few details, but you know what I, I signed up for, I mean, no, again, no regrets. It's like, I signed up for that and I, I got plenty of benefit from it as well, but it just, yep. um, yeah, it's, it's such a different dynamic to be, you know, part of a bigger team and, and, yeah. uh, you know, and try to think of the greater good as opposed to it's my, you know, it's my company and, and stuff like that. So you know, all, all, all stuff for later, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Oh, look, absolutely. The, the, you know, tra transitions and afterwards in the mindsets is, is such a, a big thing for so many people. It's, and, and a lot of people don't know what to expect. You go into this thing and all of a sudden it's, you know, you feel very differently about yourself in the business. So I, I can appreciate this. There's no, there's no kind of set of, and there's no manual or instructions on how to handle that necessarily. Right. Right. right exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And you know, the other, I mean, they, they, acquired three companies each each owner did things a little bit differently you know one you know one i know they did their full earn out and all that kind of stuff one actually left early like way early yeah. you know so it's just like i was 
you know, I stayed, you know, technically I stayed the full time. I, I left a little bit earlier and, and stayed on as a contractor, actually. Um, so I, you know, technically left a little early, but, um, but fulfilled what I needed to. But, you know, it was just every case is different. And yeah, it's, uh, yeah, they don't, they don't, it, it's hard to understand what that experience is like until you go through it once. And now, you know, now I know, and now I know what to expect and, and to kind of manage my own expectations if I were to, to sell again and, and yeah. try to, you know, and, and commit to an earnout like that. That's, that's cool. If you were to go back into another transaction, I'm just curious, like is, having had that experience that you've had, is there a couple of things that you would look to ensure that you structure, like the way you structure an earn out? Are there things that you would yeah. agree to or not agree to now now and with what you know? Yeah, good, uh, good question. I mean, you know, I do think I would put more of a priority on the, even the cash over time than the earn out. Um, yep. I just... I would need to know, and I would do a lot more due diligence on the company that was acquiring me in order to determine if I really thought I could do the earn out. Yeah. You know, again, one of the other owners of, of the other companies they bought was in a very different type. They did big government projects and, you know, you know, they were able to get a $10 million contract for five years. And thus, you know, that was nothing's easy, but that was, you know, if you get one of those, you're good, you know, versus I was a lot more project based and smaller than $10 million price point. So, you know, just thinking that through, uh, you know, I, I would put a, I wouldn't necessarily say no to an earn out, but I would say, no, I want more cash and, you know, and, mm -hmm. and calculate. Cause I, you know, I think another part of it is what my value was to the organization um, yep. was less on actual sales and business development and more on, really my subject matter expert, you know, I was bringing something to them that they didn't really have, they weren't experts in. Um, and I could really own and, and really run a department for them that had really not been run functionally before. And so that's, that, that effort takes away from bringing in business and everything like that. You know, that's, that's a whole other thing. And so, you know, again, it didn't even cross my mind. I was just like, you know, yeah, I, I've, yeah. I've been selling, I was in charge of sales my whole, the whole 14 years, like, I guess I better do that. It'll be cool. I can do all this other stuff too. And you know, it's now I know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah oh, of course, you know. And, and yeah. as you say, even even you can go into things even uh, having some of this knowledge, and you can't control the other party, right? I mean, right. And, right. and 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 sometimes you don't always know their full intentions, even. So it's you know, right. I mean, there's elements right. here that are out of our control. So um, yeah. I, I'll, I'll say one thing. I'm curious in your thoughts on this, and and uh, it, where I've spoken to people who've done earnouts. I find as a general trend that those that achieve their earnouts, they usually have an earnout that's just more simplistic. It's it's based on more simple measures as opposed, you know, um, I'm thinking of one particular chap who it was his earnout was completely based on just achieving a certain level of sales. Yeah. And and that was in his control, you know, whereas others they've they've I had to get a certain margin point and this and that and other metrics and there was lots of different little levers and I don't know. I just yeah. find as a general rule, the more complex it is, the harder it's going to be to hit it, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'll, I'll say mine was fairly simple as far as there was, there was client retention and there was new business. I mean, so there, there were two levers, I guess, so to speak, but um, it wasn't super complicated. But again, I mean, actually just really talking through this now, I realize, you know, I put so much effort into trying to grow the overall business and, you know, really trying to grow a practice area within that, uh, you know, now I'm, I'm going to beat myself a, a little up a little bit less now, I think actually thinking about this, because really, I, you know, I, I was thinking long term about the bigger company and not short term about, about my earnout. And so, you know, again, it's all's well that ends well, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it, I, I would think about it differently now. And, and again, I don't think that, I wouldn't have been able to go to them and say, no, earn out, give me all the cash. And, you know, that then they would have said, sorry, no, we'll buy someone else. So, you know, yep. also it's not all in my control either. So, yeah. but, you know, a, a different prioritization, I think I would have done differently. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And here we are back in our thousand shades of gray in the middle, right? Somewhere. Yeah, right, the, right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, great. A fascinating experience. And, and I'm, I'm really appreciative of you sharing this story. No, no yeah. doubt. You know, this kind of road, the decisions you've made, the outcomes, good, bad, and indifferent, I mean, it's obviously 
set you up for who you are today and the sort of stuff you do. I mean, how have you taken all of that experience and what are you doing today? How are you applying that out there? Yeah, I mean, so I think what I, the, the big thing that I've learned is just the need to adapt and and change. And so, you know, it took me a long time with Carousel 30 to realize that I needed to change. And, I, and I'll say it took me too long to realize because by the time I really realized big change was needed, I decided it was better to sell. Since then, I've kind of, you know, I have a podcast called The Agile World. I've, you know, embraced, I'm not a, you know, certified scrum master, like that kind of agile, but um, I have embraced this idea of agility and, and, and adaptivity so much so that I do a lot of different things. And I, you know, I, um, I primarily function as a consultant and a coach and advisor to companies, you know, some very large companies doing very complex projects, some very small companies starting out or just trying to pivot and, and things like that. But yep. I think the common thread is trying to help people manage and adapt to change and yeah. and not only one change, but continual change. And I think that's what I really learned out of this is getting out of that that agency that I owned and ran for 14 years. That was just the beginning. You know, that wasn't the end for me. That was just the beginning of I've got to change and adapt and adopt new skills and learn new things. And that will never change for the rest of my career. And so, you know, I've, I've, I took what I learned in marketing and what I learned about business and have applied it to several other things. I, you know, I started another consulting company and actually left that company, got bought out from that. During that course, I acquired, a, a, you know, we acquired another company started a startup and halfway through that acquired another company, you know, to, to grow that, <laughs> um, left or uh, I'm leaving that one. Like, you know, that's, that's for another show. We can talk about that process, but, um, and now I'm, you know, now I'm consulting and advising. And so, you know, it's kind of just, I, I see this as, I don't necessarily know what two years from now is going to look like, but I know that I will continue to strive to, to, you know, try to see, at least a few miles ahead and try to adapt to that. And, you know, that's what I try to do with my customers. No, that's very cool. And, and clearly this this feeds through to the customer experience side of things. And I understand you've even written a couple of books. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, that was something that I, um, part of my contract when I sold my, when I sold Carousel 30 was I want to write a book and I want the rights to it. And, you know, cause there's a, you know, work for hire and, you know, all of that, all of that contractual language. And I was just like, yeah, you know, anything that I do for you, that's cool. You own it, but not my book. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so, you know, that started it. And, you know, since then I've written several other books, but um, yeah, that, that process is, I really started focusing on my personal brand as well. And just trying to have a, you know, it, it ended up being the, this, this agile concept of, you know, of business, but Took me a little while to figure it out, but I, I I did realize that, you know, for me, Carousel 30 was kind of me at one point. And that that was the other. I don't think that was a good thing. I don't think that was a healthy or, a, or a, like I actually had I intentionally created a personal email account for myself in order to separate because I didn't even have one. Mm -hmm. I everything was Carousel 30 and like it was starting to be like, you know, who who's who here. So. I made a lot of intention on, you know, I'm not going to, I'm going to tie myself to the brands and the companies that I work, work for, but I'm always going to have this separation between me and, and what I do so that, that that keeps me nimble. That means that I can be involved in several things at the same time. It means that I can leave something and it's not catastrophic and, you know, I have to start from scratch. Like I'm now always autonomous in a sense, even if I bring on partners for other ventures or or stuff like that. And I think that that in itself has been incredibly valuable. And and what a massive piece of advice for everybody here. I mean, that that mental separation between you and your business. Um, you know, I, I you know, at the risk of being repetitive for people who've heard a few episodes, I mean, I'm I'm just a massive believer that, you know, we're not we're not born to do business, we're born to live. You know, and, right. and the biggest question you've got to ask yourself is what kind of life do you want? And then, you know, we use our business, which is just an asset to, to help deliver, you know, be the vehicle to deliver you the life you want. So, um, so actually having that separation, what you've described there is something I think a lot of business owners and entrepreneurs feel at times. Um, and so even as simple as having a separate personal email starts to help you make that mental shift, right? 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, so my background, I mean, my my dad had his own company. He, you know, so I I thought that kids whose parents went to work and had like two weeks of vacation every year or whatever, like I thought they were the weird ones, you know, but it <laughs> turns out, you know, my dad, I mean, he traveled a lot. He was like a traveling salesman, basically. So, you know, we would go on, you know, quote unquote vacation with him. It really was us tagging along with him on his sales trips or whatever. But it's like, I had kind of a unique situation, but didn't even realize it until, you know, until I got a couple jobs out of college. And so that that's also why it was so natural for me to say, oh, you know what, screw this, I'm not going to work for anybody else again, because that was modeled to me my entire life. But, you know, the downside, my dad, you know, now he's he's retired, but he worked until he was about 85 years old. Um, and, you know, again, he loved what he was doing and, you know, amazing, like put me through college, like amazing, amazing role model for me, except there never was that separation. And I think that's, you know, that is something that I, you know, I, I saw and tried to, you know, tried to, you know, intentionally make a separation there. Cause you know, I, I, as many things as I want to emulate about my dad, that, that wasn't one thing that I wanted was just, uh, you know, to not have a any any kind of separation because I want to reserve the option to get a job someday and maybe I'll be sick of consulting in 10 years who knows you know yeah, I want yeah. to leave those options for myself no it makes perfect sense perfect sense um Greg I'm gonna la last question I'm so cognizant of your time and you've actually been so generous today so um who is the who's you know your ideal customer who are the people that you really know you help the most at the moment yeah, so I think um, enterprise organizations that are struggling. So I, I work, even though I owned an agency, I work more on the client side. And so I, I, I work with leaders at organizations that they probably have a consulting firm or an agency on retainer or working on a project, but they're struggling a little bit to either adapt to the working relationship or just manage a big change related project. And I mean, this could be a large website project. This could be customer experience. This could be employee experience. I've worked in all of those. I, you know, I have a very diverse experience set that is more based around managing change than it is about any one particular thing. When an organization is struggling a bit, whether it's the internal team kind of struggling with maximizing value in the in the agency relationship, or simply just um, you know needs a little bit coach of coaching on how to do their part to make make something more valuable, that's where I really really excel. Um, I do awesome. also work with smaller organizations and, and startups, you know, from time to time when I feel like I can be of of good of good value. But I think really you know in that I would say financial services, healthcare, you know. I do well with really complex, highly regulated industries for some mm. reason. It's just I like I like complicated problems. So, um, you know, and and those industries in particular have certainly have their um, their share of them. And and you know, I like working with teams. I like being a coach to people and and helping them achieve um, you know amazing stuff. Oh man, that's awesome. That is absolutely awesome. And are you okay for people to reach out and connect with you? Yeah, absolutely. I'm really um, active on LinkedIn, so that's a great place to reach me. Um, also, my website is theagile.world, um, so you can feel free to reach out to me there. You can see more about my books, my blog, podcast, all that stuff as well. Awesome, awesome. Well, look, we'll, we'll put a link to your LinkedIn and The Agile World in the show notes here. But um, and, and for those listening, please, if you reach out to Greg on LinkedIn and send him a connection request, maybe just put a little note there saying you you heard him on the Buy, Build, Sell podcast so he actually understands you know, the reason you're reaching out. So uh, that would be nice. And um, Greg, mate, thank you so much for making the time and, and, and just for being so open and sharing your story. I, you know, it's I, the good, the bad and the ugly, right? Like that's that's how we yeah. learn. And, and I think, you know, if, if your story can help a couple of other business owners and entrepreneurs on their journey, then then we've done some good today. So um, yeah, absolutely. Mate, Love it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so thank much for so having me. Oh, absolute pleasure. I'm, I'm really grateful. And, and thanks again for your time. Thanks.